This episode may contain content of a graphic nature. Listener discretion is advised. Thanks for joining us today on another episode of Body to Burial. I'm Mariah. And I'm Nikki. We're just two regular true crime junkies who decided it was time to see crime from a new perspective. This is Body to Burial. Hey, Nikki. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm super excited for our episode this week. We have somebody amazing. Okay. We will be speaking with Mitzi Wood Von Meisner. She is the director of the Narrow Ridge Earth Literacy Center and Natural Burial Preserve. So we will be speaking with her about all things related to natural burials. Okay. That means like not in a casket? Sort of a thing. Right. Right. So I don't know if you watched Six Feet Under or not. Were you a fan of that show? Long time ago. Yeah. But I a long time ago. can't remember. But remember his brother dies and they wrapped him in the shroud and like buried him out by the trees. Do you remember that? Mm. It cried my eyes out. It was a great, great ending episode. But that's what this is essentially. It's a greener way to be Processed, I guess you could say process is probably not the nicest way to put it, but um, (laughs) leaving a smaller carbon footprint, if you will. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I think it'll be great. And I'm curious to know if our conversation with her sways you at all. What is your stance right now? Are you a... No, cremation all the way. Cremation all Mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see, same. I The idea of the box terrifies me. I don't know why, because obviously I probably won't know, but just like being in the ground and I don't know, I don't like it. Freaks I me talked out. to my dad about it last night and he said that he wants to be cremated and because he doesn't want to be buried because what if he wakes up and he wants to be cremated to make sure he's really dead and then he's gone. Bye-bye. I, I mean, yeah, at least you have no chance of like a false... False death. Yes. Because he said, what if he wakes up and then he's like knocking on the box and no. Mm -mm. Yeah. I'm interested to see how you feel about being cremated after you talk to her, because after my initial conversation with her, I definitely, definitely have some opinions. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get her started. I'm going to bring Mitzi on. Hey, Mitzi, it's Mariah. Hi, Mariah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Awesome. You didn't have a chance to meet my co-host last time. Um, Nikki, she is on the line with us. Nikki, this is Mitzi. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. So what is a natural burial preserve? Okay, so there are different models of natural burial, but my understanding is that most natural burial preserves are trying to do things that minimize impact to the natural environment, reducing the use of um, unnecessary metals, uh, formaldehyde, chemicals, just extraction and waste kinds of issues that any environmentally conscious person would be concerned about. What happens when like a section is full, part of the green burial kind of experience, if you will, is that the land just naturally overtakes as it would. Is that right? Yeah. So for the five acres that we started out with, our plan is that as each cluster of graves, each section is filled, we will allow for natural forest cessation to take place. Now, for the five acres that we're planning on designating in a an adjoining area, that we will manage for songbird and pollinator habitat. So wow. that's a little bit of a different model, but for for the one that we've had for since 2013, um, the plan has been to let it return to forest. This might be a silly question, but once you allow for the overgrowth to kind of happen in the burial sites. If my loved one is placed there, am I still able to go back to the burial site and like pay respects or is there like a trail marked off or how does that work? Yeah, our plan is to have trails around each section so that there's easy access to the graves. Um, And my understanding is that natural burial preserves all have their 
different ways of doing things. But that's our way of doing it is to have a trail system around each section. Can you do pets? Like if your dog was cremated or whatever else, could they go with you? Well, that's an interesting question. It's a tricky thing. People and their pets don't typically die at the same time. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, that presents, you know, some some tricky kinds of uh, issues. If you were to open it up to where you had spaces designated for pets, then you would quickly fill up the cemetery because their lifespan is so short. And it was a, a you know, question that we went around and round with uh, at, when we were you know, deciding to set aside the land for uh, natural burial. Um, we have made um, one exception for uh, cremains of a pet to be buried with a person, and those were kind of extraordinary kind of circumstances that uh, the pet died within, I think, weeks of the woman who died. Wow. Yeah. Um, but f- for the most part, um, we don't accept human or pet cremains, although there are some exceptions. And why is that with the, with the ashes? It's. Well, we, so we were never really that interested in like the cemetery. We're not in the cemetery business, so to speak. I mean, we're an earth literacy center. When we, when we started the natural burial, we did it primarily because the people who live um, on the land trust, which, are, which is Narrow Ridge, we have community land trust, we are trying to um, live sustainably and die sustainably. So we set it aside because it's how we wanted to um, treat the end of our lives and to deal with death and dying. And we also wanted to be able to demonstrate the sort of natural cycles of life, of living and dying with our natural burial preserve. And so it was a big question, and, and, and it was, I'd say, maybe even a controversial one because people have such strong opinions when it comes to death, with some people feeling very strongly about cremation one way or the other. But we ultimately decided that there are lots of other uh, places where people have options for cremation and for the model that we are trying to kind of uh, demonstrate where um, your body's allowed to do what it will do naturally and to kind of honor the, the natural cycles of life and death, we decided that we would just go that route. As, and it's also because cremation does come with a high carbon uh, footprint and it's poorly regulated. And so there are some other issues related to cremation that we don't think it's the most sustainable of options, although we do know that there are uh, reasons why a person may choose to have cremation as their end of life choice. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, Mitzi, because I, you know, um, I always wanted to be cremated. Um, That was kind of what I thought that I wanted, but it's interesting because after you and I had our initial conversation, my opinion of that kind of changed because I actually did some more research on what it truly meant to be cremated. And just for like, you know, perspective, I didn't realize that to cremate one individual, it takes 28 gallons of fuel for one person. And that's just like, I couldn't believe that when I read that, you know? Um, Right. And I think that they said that that translates to something of like 540 pounds of carbon dioxide. So I guess it's just, it's one of these interesting things because if you aren't truly educated in the process of how cremation works, you really don't know how much you're affecting the environment by choosing that route. Right. And so that's been one of the important things about the Natural Burial Preserve is that, you know, our our original mission is really one of education. We have had some people who have said, well, I was going to be cremated. And then after kind of learning about this, I've made a decision to do otherwise. And a lot of people are, choose to be cremated specifically because it's a, a more affordable option, not necessarily because it's the way they really want their body to be treated, at, you know, upon death. I'm glad that people have, you know, something that's more affordable to them in the way of cremation, because I think in a lot of places, uh, people haven't been able to afford to bury their loved ones. And so that's why they've opted for it. But so we're, we're trying to provide an option that we consider more sustainable and affordable. 
So with yours, you don't um, embalm or there's no embalming. There's no nothing like that. Correct. Can people buy like a like a husband and a wife or a family like where they, you know, like on a traditional cemetery or mausoleum or wherever you can be next to the person or is that the case with this or no? Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. I mean, if somebody is choosing a site because a loved one has died, we will ask them, do you anticipate wanting a burial site next to them or are you know, see if they're going to want one or more and we'll reserve them for however many people they want them for. I mean, this is, this might be a graphic question, but it's definitely something that pops in my mind when we're having these conversations. What about like wild animals? Like, because I think of like having something in my backyard and my dog, like digging it up. Yeah. I think that the idea that a, that a wild animal would dig up anything that's buried, you know, right now OSHA saying three and a half uh, feet into the ground, not just for natural, just for burials, and and so it, it's just not an issue. It's just too far down. It's not. We've it's, believe me, we have a lot of wildlife around here, and that's not an issue. We've never had any disturbance of graves. You guys uh, bury more shallow than six feet. Is that right? Well, not just green burial, but but other burials as well. Six feet, sort of the way of the past. It's just kind of in our minds, you know, okay. six feet under. But burial is typically not six feet these days. It's it's higher because, especially in the state of Tennessee, there's you know cars or like um, cave underground caves, and there's mm-hmm. cave ins and things like that. So you don't want to go too far into the ground. There's more of microorganisms that do the work of decomposing, you know, closer to the surface than deeper in the surface of the, of the ground. What are the options? Like, I know that you guys don't do traditional caskets. So what is my body transported in or what can it be transported in? So basically from our point of view, if it's biodegradable, then that would be a suitable container. So it could be a, a wooden casket. We would ask that you that we prefer that the wood be local and, and sustainably harvested. That's our preference. Um, we wouldn't want you know something exotic or endanger you endangered woods to be used unless it was something reclaimed or repurposed. So you could have a wooden casket. You could have um, a linen shroud. Um, you could we have buried people in cotton sheets, um, quilts. So, you know, something that will biodegrade. So they could bring something from home, essentially. Like if I had a quilt that like reminded my family or was mine that they thought that would be comforting to me, they could potentially use that? Yes, they could. Um, We would want to know ahead of time because the lowering of the body uh, into the ground without thinking through how to do that with say just a sheet or just a blanket there, you know, it just takes a little thinking through how to do that. And, and we've been doing it now for a while. I see what you're getting at. So like the shrouds have some sort of built in handle, if you will, to help. Lower. Right. They have, right. Gotcha. Not all shrouds do, but the one that we purchase, um, as, as people who, who, you know, operate a cemetery, we purchase from King Caraco shrouds you may have heard of them they're out of california and the the style that we purchase has uh sewn in handles made of the same fabric as well as sewn in strap lowering straps and it has also a um a wooden backboard sewn into it that doesn't go the full length of the body it's about four feet but it provides a little bit of uh rigidity to to um so it's easier for the people the pallbearers to lower the body are you doing a uh like a barrel a week or is that more no so this year we did i think 16 you know we don't advertise <laughs> I think people are finding us online these days and word of mouth. But, um, you know, we're not a commercial cemetery. We're a community cemetery. We really did this, as I said before, because that's how, you know, it's how I want to be buried. But it's also a part of a movement, the natural burial movement that we're happy to be a part of. We're trying to demonstrate just different ways of doing things. And this is our approach to dealing with death in a more sustainable way. Could anybody that has land, like if I had 
six acres or four acres, could I essentially do this on my own at my own house? Depending on where you live and what the city and local ordinances are, um, yes. Especially if you live if you lived in a rural place in the state of Tennessee, a person can be buried on their own private property, um, provided that it doesn't go against any local ordinances. So you know, if you live in the suburbs, I'd say no. Okay, if you live in the yeah. city, I'd say no. <laughs> I right? but if you live in a... think your neighbors are burying <laughs> themselves in the backyard, Nikki. No. Right. No, I, I mean, mean, I don't. I love I'm my, out in Tennessee, though, so I might have some uh, ghostly neighbors, but. I'm in California, so I don't know if if my neighbors would really like that. Yeah, I mean, even in Tennessee, which is, you know, kind of a state that doesn't love regulation of any sort. <laughs> um, yeah, it means sub, you're not going to do this in the suburbs. You're going to have to be in a, in, the, in a rural, at least a place that, you know, not a suburban cul-de-sac neighborhood. Okay. Yeah, I would be a little nervous to buy land that was on a burial ground. I'd be like, oh, mm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, usually, nervous. you know, in the, in rural places, you know, um, it wouldn't be uncommon for a large farm to have had a small family plot. Mm-hmm. And I don't know from where I stand, there's something kind of sweet about that, you know, sense of history and, you know, connection to the land. As long as it's not like Pet cemetery, that would freak me out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That might make me a little nervous. Yeah. Yeah, but I think a lot of places you would think that, I mean, there's probably a lot buried that you wouldn't even think about in places in homes and land and all that. Oh, sure. I mean, well, especially with the idea that we, you know, live on what was a a frontier at one time, Mm -hmm. as well as Native Americans and, and, um, you know, lots of bones have rested on the land, human and otherwise, that we'll never know. Yeah. And this is how, so this is how they used to basically bury Families would do this back when cremation wasn't an option. And I mean, back years and years and years, hundreds of years ago, correct? And not and not that long ago. Embalming really became more mainstream after the Civil War. And so when, when soldiers were dying away from home and needed to be transported and they wanted to preserve the body, they would they would preserve the body with embalming fluid. And at some point after that, it became institutionalized. But for the bulk of humanity, and certainly Western civilization, embalming is very, very new. But for the bulk of humanity, people have been burying their loved ones in the ground in wooden caskets. That's interesting. I didn't even know that that's in the Civil War that they did that, that that's how it basically started with the formaldehyde or the Mm -hmm. embalming. I think that's an interesting point though, Mitzi, that you bring up that it's this type of burial is really what has been happening for decades, if you will. But I think having a green burial gives families maybe the potential to be more involved. Do you, do you see, um, family members coming out and like helping to dig the holes or to cover them up? Like, I just feel like it would be a more um, private, intimate experience and kind of definitely how it definitely how death was supposed to be. I feel like our society doesn't really want to talk about it. We don't want to see it. We just kind of like pass it off and then we do the funeral thing and we're done. But I feel like there might be um, almost like a beautiful moment that can, that it could be happening on the green burials. A- absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, for one thing, it's a beautiful place. And, I, and I'm sure that's true of natural burial preserves elsewhere. Um, but it's a beautiful place. There's nothing institutional about it. You know, the land is not groomed like a golf course. You know, it's, it has a um, sort of, it's not uniform. And, and uh, the, the graves are mounded because they're just, we're allowing the ground to settle on its own accord. Um, but we've had some people who have chosen to open the grave themselves, hand dig graves. I would say that it's the minority of, of instances because it's hard work. 
But um, we have had uh, a number of people who've chosen to do that for a loved one that they've both opened and closed a grave. Um, More often, though, we've had people to help with either whether it's to take a handful of dirt off of the 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 mound that has come out of the grave and put that back on into the grave or actually shovels full. We've had family members to do that, to, f- to throw, um, f- you know, f- cut flowers down into the grave or a, a note. Um, but it's really self-directed. Um, we've had uh, one man who actually um, stepped down into the grave and was handed um, the body of his wife. And he laid her then there down at his feet, and his friends. Um, she was a sh- she had died of cancer. She was very frail. Um, his friends were handing him buckets full of dirt that he covered her up with a sort of protective blanket before the backhoe operator covered her the rest of the way, because it just for his sensibilities, he had a hard time. Um, just imagining the the dirt being dropped down on her, you know, from machinery. Um, so talk about intimate. I mean, that's the most intimate of any of the, the self-directed ceremonies that, you know, I've attended. But yes, I mean, there's something therapeutic about um, being there, watching the grave being closed in, whether it's, whether you're participating or you're just seeing it happen. Um, the idea of that is harder for people than the reality of it because we have, we have just treated death in such a sterile way. Now that hearing you talk about that, and I'm taking myself back, my mom passed in December and just there were things that were very intimate that I never thought I could do. Mm-hmm. But then you do because you love this person. And I can, I could, I just picture myself when you're telling that story about that guy getting into the grave, you know, doing that for my mom, because it would be like, you know, that, that you don't, even though for me, I have a hard time separating. You, some people think once you, your soul is gone, then the body. And, and I have a thing with, you know, that's their body, that's them. And that, and even though they're, some people say they're not there. I would want to respect if it was my mom, my father-in-law, my anybody, you know, like the idea of the being so intimate with the whole process, which to some might sound weird, but to me now hearing you say it is interesting because it, I can picture that being a very special intimate moment as well as very sad, but you know. I also think there's something therapeutic about it. Like Mitzi said, though, I think there is something potentially that would make your heart not hurt a little less, but feel maybe a slight bit of peace. I don't know how, mm-hmm. how to phrase it, but well, yeah, it's like my, when my mom was cremated and we, my dad and I went to the uh, funeral home and we watched, um, you know, we had a little, you know, goodbye. And, and for me, I needed her to have pictures and letters and things from us. And then we saw her go into the cream, you know, where they cremate you. And most people don't even want to see that process. They just want to be out of sight, out of mind and it's happening and they move on. But like, for me, I felt like it was like, you're there every step of the way. And like, you know, it's more of an intimate process, but my next question would probably be like, if say I wanted to have my mom do the green barrier or or even myself, I need to have like these pictures for whatever it is in my brain. It makes me feel better that they have like family photos. Is that something that they can be buried with? Like I like to give like my grandma and grandpa, they were cremated and I put them in the, they, they were in that mausoleum and my grandpa liked his Bud Light. So we put a Budweiser in there and like, you know, like that sort of thing. Is that, are you able to like bring stuff with you or just no? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, I've never had anyone ask me exactly the question that you, that you have, but you know, we've had people buried with their wedding ring, um, 
one of the burials they actually there was a uh, where friends had dug the grave for their their friend um they had a cooler of beer and they actually poured his favorite <laughs> beer on top of the grave. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's certainly that freedom to do it your way when it comes to, you know, does somebody want to put a photo in there? You know, I think that taking, you know, sort of a dogmatic, um, rigid approach, I, you know, I would not, re- you know, I would not object to a photo or two. I wouldn't want a lot of, you know, a lot of synthetics in there that wouldn't, you know, biodegrade, like but <laughs> like a whole al- <laughs> photo book album. Probably not. Probably not. But I mean, I think there's a, there's room for ways to create ritual um, and to and meet the spirit as well as the basic intention of what we're trying to do without getting dogmatic about it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, I mean, for me, it's just part of, I guess like, and maybe that's part of my process because it was my, when my mom's family passed, when my dad's family passed, we always put like a little something in there and like letters and pictures. And, you know, for us, I feel like then maybe that's kind of, what we need for us to feel that sentimental or I don't even know what it is, but it just makes us feel better. (laughs) But when you say this, it kind of brings to my mind because, because like of our environmental mission, it's an opportunity to say, well, let's think about that. Are there ways that we can meet what you need to feel good? Like you could do a photo, you could do like a, um, a photocopy of, Mm you know, of photos yeah, and have paper. There's lots of ways you could, it's an opportunity to think about how can we, how can we work with this in a way that challenges us to do it, to honor the sort of the natural burial intentions, but also meets your need to ritualize. Ritual is important for closure, for marking these important parts of a life. We invite people to create their own meaningful ceremony to read whether it's secular or or religious text to sing or not or but to do what makes sense to them to reclaim in a in non-institutional manner of of laying our loved ones to rest yeah that's got to be for you like to you know, see these families and like, it, it's got to be personal for you too, because you're seeing these families at the probably worst times at one of the worst times in their lives mm-hmm. is, you know, having to be burying their loved one is not a fun occasion. So that's got to be, but it's also got to see like the beauty in family and love and connections and, you know, all of that that goes along with the Sadness, you know? Absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, death, death is the great perspective shifter. I mean, um, we kind of put it out of our minds, but when we, when we remember, you know, that our, our, our life as sort of mortal beings, whatever you believe after that is, is for you to come to your own conclusions about, but we all know that, in, in these bodies that we live in, they're finite. They don't last forever. And so when someone dies, we're kind of reminded to think about what really matters. How do we spend our time? And so I, I think that um, the opportunity of being with people um, at such a poignant time in their lives when they're saying goodbye to a family member, they're very aware that in that moment that this is the way of all flesh, not just the one they're saying goodbye to, but for all of us. And you cannot help but be aware of that. Yeah, that's... I mean, that's, that's a, a I don't even know how to respond way to, to that. Put it. <laughs> yeah, that was just so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that is a beautiful way to put it. How, maybe dumb question, but um, if someone passes how does the body get to you? Is it still going the traditional route of like a funeral home and is it being picked up from there or how does that transpire? More often than not, there is a funeral home involved. In Tennessee, 
a person has the right to transport uh, the deceased body of a loved one. How long can a body stay at a funeral home? Like, is there a window with in which like the body has to be out of there so it has to come to you guys? My understanding had always been that an unembalmed body you needed to to uh, bury within 72 hours. Yeah, I was assuming. We it. have had the instance where a funeral home kept a body in refrigeration beyond that, but typically the 72 hours is is my understanding. What about people that are donors? Like I'm an organ donor. Does that affect my eligibility, if you will, to be buried? No, we we have buried uh, organ donors. You know, I don't know exactly how that was arranged, but I know that um, one of the men that was buried a couple of years ago, I'm not sure where he went. I'm not sure where the body was taken to remove the organs, but they did do so. I know that it's possible. So you, like he was buried a couple of years ago. So now his site where he was buried on, are, are there things growing on top already, like forest type stuff? Well, so his wife has not died. So until a section of the graves has completely been filled, we don't allow for anything more than a shrub to grow. We keep it, we keep it mowed, um, not like pristine mode, but we keep it mode to where, you know, trees aren't growing until after a section is filled. Now that will be a while because it's not like you have a section of grave that everyone in it is elderly. You'll have some people who you know, are not likely to die for, you know, 20 or 30 years because they're not that old. How do you spend your work day helping other people cope through their darkness and then go home and like have a conversation with a girlfriend. I've got it. I would think that it's very hard for you to function in your own life. Well, you know, so before I was the director of Narrow Ridge, I was, I was a practicing psychologist and I worked the bulk of my career in nursing homes. So I've been dealing with the dying process, not death, but the process of dying for a long time, professionally. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I was asked that question when I was a psychologist, you know, how do you deal with it when you go home? It can be very sad, but I don't think I'm dealing with people in their worst moments. I think I'm often dealing with them in their best moments. I'm sure you can recall a funeral that you've been to where you reunite with people you haven't seen in a long time. So, you know, you're not just seeing people say goodbye. You're seeing people reunite with loved ones. You're seeing people holding one another, singing songs together, often laughing, you know, about memories of the person that they've said goodbye to, celebrating the person that, that they're saying goodbye to. You know, some some burials are harder than others. Some are more tragic. Some are sadder. Um, than others. And how do you deal with it? I mean, it's just another part of life. Life deals you all kinds of hard things and we find places to put it and live the other parts of our life. I mean, it's more than anything, it's a privilege. I I don't feel it as a burden in any way. It has felt, um, whether it was dealing with people when they were aging as a psychologist or dealing with people who are dealing with the pending death or the death of a loved one, it really feels like an honor. People are at their most real, their most tender and vulnerable, and they can't help but let it be seen because they're cracked open. A lot of, of life, we're managing our presentations. So when you see the realness of people, that's something really special. So I don't feel like I go home and say, oh, woe is me. How do I deal with this heavy load? No, I feel really fortunate that I'm allowed to be a part of it. When you talk like that, it just, with being in this, ex- oh, it made me cry. with being in this experience not too long ago and just, you know, having my mom and my father-in-law passed a month after my mom, but knowing that these people that are perfect strangers, you know, like they, they don't know my family member, the pain that we feel to feel that is a good feeling, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it is very, excuse me, comforting for 
a person who it is at their worst. And then there, and it, and it is everything that you just described, which is the laughing. And I mean, the sad, I mean, it is everything literally that you just described. Mm-hmm. So it is as a person who has just recently gone through that, it's a nice thing to know that someone on the other end feels that way. <laughs> yeah. I guess that it's yeah. not just a nine to five to somebody, you know, that they're just exactly. clocking in, yeah. clocking right. out, but that they're recognizing, um, yeah. this humanity. person that is special yeah. to someone else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I think that a lot of people go into, you know, the funeral home or cemetery business with a sense of mission and calling. And, and certainly there are those who, you know, I, I'm troubled by um, the costs and the and the kind of commercialization of cemeteries and funerals, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some good folks who who really care and um, are sensitive to what people are going through. The way that you describe it and the way that you're describing it is a lot more peaceful than like. I remember hearing that like you can't when you drive past a cemetery, you got to hold your breath. Otherwise, the souls will get Mm -hmm. sucked into you. And like, you know, (laughs) you can't like step on a grave or they're going to like grab you and like, you know, all that stuff. But the way that you describe it is very peaceful and a Mm -hmm. nice place to be instead of uh, what you typically think in your head and or on front lawns for Halloween. <laughs> like, right, you know, right. Like, that a zombie's going to get you. Right. Well, my mother, so I'm 53. My mother is 84. My mother recalls when her grandfather died. He was laid on a table or a bed or something in, in the main room of the house. And they had a wake. People came over. Um, so we have it. It's not that far back. It's not that far back that we had a more intimate experience, not just with birth, but with death. And um, and I think it's a, I think it's a good thing that that there's a movement that you know I'm happy to be a part of. There's a movement that says, um, no, we can do this. We don't have to treat this as something alien. This is a part of living. And it's something that we benefit from engaging with in a more intimate way. Well, I'll tell you, I was dead set 100% that I was being cremated before we started talking. (laughs) And now talking to you, it's kind of opened my mind to there could be a better option out there that I didn't even think, to be honest with you, existed, you know, like, like I thought a natural death was something or a natural burial was something that like hippie or, you know, like, Oh, I could never do that. Or, you know, but the way that you describe it is very beautiful and peaceful and beautiful for the families. I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it has been a beautiful experience. I would have never known, you know, if somebody told me 20 years ago, you're going to be helping bury people. You know, it was never in my, it was never a dream of mine. But that's the kind of cool thing about life. It, you know, if you if you are open, you may find yourself doing something that you never knew would be rewarding. You never knew you'd find it to be meaningful. Yeah, I I everyone thinks they have a path. Like I do hair, I'm a hairdresser and Mm -hmm. never did I think that at some point in my life, would I be even talking to people that are associated with like death and dying and crimes and, you know, burials Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and it's very neat to kind of hear everyone's perspective like job and life and what they do and Mm -hmm. really like get a different view of it because my view of it was just what I thought in my head. And then hearing you speak is totally not what I had in my head, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's Mm -hmm. really neat. 
Oh, cool. That makes, that makes me feel good to hear you say that. Yeah. I mean, I was literally just thinking my son has like an extreme fear of death, but Mm -hmm. I feel like if he listened to you and the way you talk about everybody coming together and the experience, I almost feel like that is, would bring so much peace to him. Like, Mm -hmm. don't you think Nikki? I mean, it just sounds so like safe and secure and like, it like literally made me feel warm and fuzzy. (laughs) Yeah. Like it Mm -hmm. literally doesn't feel like this overwhelming fear of the unknown. It feels like everything's okay because it's, everybody's here. It's calm. It's peaceful. Mm -hmm. It's intimate. And not that you can't have those things with, you know, other routes, but I just feel like being in the nature and like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, I picture it in my head and I'm just like, I, that's just a beautiful way to end. You know, I pictured it Mm -hmm. like that meadow and, um, twilight, that twilight movie. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, you know, fear of death, it really is natural. I mean, death anxiety is something that that everyone has and we suppress in order to cope with living, you know. Yeah. But, you know, now that that I'm older and my parents are older and I know that it's closer, you know, than it than it has been for me, it, it's still something I have to work with. Right. I have to work with this Awareness. I mean, it's like any fear. The more you avoid it, the more you try to keep it away from you, the scarier it is. So I, I think it is important for us to have conversations about death. I think it is important for peop- for children to go to, to funerals and yeah. burials. I think, and I think our society tries to safeguard, you know, and they think that they're safeguarding by shielding, right? But I think if we go back to the basics, if you will, and take the ritual of death back with the family and making it more intimate and personal and just being involved would probably help ease a lot of the fear. I know that for my kids, when my mom passed and was passing, they were part of the process from step one to the last step. And even... After she had passed, we had her at the at our home at my family home um, for a- hours, and they just laid with her and oh. talked with her. And I didn't want to shield that from them to make it a scary experience because to me, she's not a scary person. This is a person we love. We you know, mm-hmm. and it's a process that I think is essential for everyone, not just children. And, you know, I, I think that process is good for everybody, you know, really, but with them, with my kids, I didn't want them to, I mean, they're going to know this is a part of life, whether it's a parent, grandparent, dog, hamster, whatever. And I've been like that with my kids. Our hamster died and was dying and we're holding it in a blanket and, you know, the whole process and same thing with our dog and, you know, and cause I think if you shield them from it, then they create the idea of something scary and you know what it's not, which can be beautiful. Right. And, and they're going to be dealing with it again and again and again, as we all are. And so they've, they've had a really valuable experience thanks to you that, wasn't just important for the moment, but will help them as they continue in life and face the inevitable death of other loved ones, whether they're human or not. Yeah. And we had, because a month after my mom passed, my father-in-law passed and we saw him and did the whole thing. And then uh, about five months later, six months later, our family dog of 17 years passed and Mm. we had a... um, uh, in home euthanasia, which was, oh, I'll never go to the vet again. I mean, it was just so intimate and so everything we needed for mm. what's been happening this whole year. And the kids were involved in the whole entire process. And, wow. you know, you think like some people you talk to, they're like, you're crazy. You're ruining them. You're going to, you know, ruin their 
their childhood or whatever else. But I feel like to me personally, I think it helps them become more sensitive and more aware and whatever else, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Good for you. Yeah. All right, Mitzi. Now we're going to go to just the kind of relax section. Um, Nikki's just going to ask you a couple random questions. Some of them are silly and lighthearted and some might be a little more serious about your job. Um, but I'm going to kick it over to her. Sure. What do you like most about your job? Just being a witness to um, other people saying goodbye to a life of someone that, th- that has been a- important to them. This is one that I just, it's pretty just whatever, but it's, uh, what is your favorite holiday? <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> um, I think it's Christmas because my family gets together. Okay. I love Christmas. What do you do as your hobbies? I am a singer and um, infrequent songwriter. Really? What style of music do you do, Mitzi? You know, I don't know. I I love to sing. If it's a cover, I love to sing sort of the old standards like Summertime and What a Wonderful World. My father is a musician, uh, singer-songwriter, and so I grew up performing with him. But um, I like to do a little of this and a little of that. I love it. I love it. My dad says I have a voice of an angel, but I can't sing. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. Is there a question that you get asked most about your job? Um, Well, because there's a focus on sustainability, there seems to be some questions like, what do you miss the most? about your life prior to being the director of Narrow Ridge, which I always find a kind of funny question. Um, so that's, that's a question I get asked, and it, it always seems like it's because they don't, they don't really know what my life is like. <laughs> <laughs> this is one we always ask everybody. Um, if you had to pick a s- song to be the theme song for your job... What's for my job, <laughs> for my job, um, I think I'd still, I think I would say what a wonderful world because my job really does give me the opportunity to, to see that. That is a perfect one. I can see right? you. Like that, I can I just can. like feel it and see it and like picture it. <laughs> yes, I can too. It's Fully. Perfect. That's the perfect answer. Uh, what profession would you tell dinner guests you do if you didn't want to spend the night talking about your job? <laughs> um, like you just make something up like lie and yeah. say this is what I do yeah well I think I'd say I was a singer I love it <laughs> I'm a Grammy award winning artist <laughs> <laughs> what do you like least about your job I'm um, sitting at my computer <laughs> that's fair that's a good one would you say that being in your role has eased or solidified that fear of death. Like I know you mentioned as a child, you were fearful of like your parents dying. Do you feel like that that fear has been at all relieved or intensified? Oh, certainly it's been eased. Um, And I do think that the work with burial helps because I'm just facing it. I'm just facing the inevitable. Um, more often. And, and so, yeah, I think it, it has eased as I see other people go through it and and survive it, you know, because I think there is a sense like how you, how do you, you know, how do I go on from here? And I think everybody feels that when it's a really deep loss, like where do we go from here? Um, but we do keep going. I have one like silly one. What's your favorite TV show? <laughs> um, let me think about that. If I could watch anything. <laughs> I do like I Love Lucy. Are you and excited for the remake? The Mary- Sorry? Are you is there excited? a remake? I didn't even yeah. know. Who is, who's going to do it? Um, Nicole Kidman. Is oh, Lucille she's good at everything. I know it's, it's she's, actually going to be a movie, it. not like a series. But um, I've seen like some little clips and what have you, and it looks incredible. 
Uh huh. Well, I guess it's hard, you know, when you like somebody so much, but she's pretty talented. So I, I think if anybody can do it, I'm sure she can pull it off. Yeah, for sure. I think so. And I think we'll end with this question because I think that this will let us know what kind of person you are, Mitzi. So when you're getting ice out of your fridge and some ice falls on the floor, do you pick it up or do you kick it under your fridge? <laughs> um, I might just let it melt right there on the I floor. Love it. <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. That's great. All right. Well, I think we did it, ladies. I think we got some great content. Mincy, like you are just so wonderful the way that you You describe your mission and like what you are doing. And you a hundred percent changed my mind. I cannot tell you that I the amount of research that I did after we talked on the phone because I very much align with Nikki that like I had this like hippy dippy like you just have this like notion of what you think it is but that's not rooted in fact at all um so I definitely have changed my mind about what I'm going to do and um that's a big part to you so thank you for that hey thank I you appreciate it. thank you yeah thank well, go you so ye much. and spread the world <laughs> I mean, go, go ye and spread the word that uh that there's more than one way to do this right? I will. Yeah. and I think that that's one yeah. of the things too is like you just do what has been done like you know mm-hmm. this person was buried so you're like oh I'll be buried whatever you know like right. you don't really right. think about it and then like you said a lot of times a lot of people don't plan ahead so People are just probably assuming, well, we'll just do what their parents did, you know? Right. So, right. Yeah. Well, here's to well, it was great. Making changes. Thank you so much. One thing that people should know is that if they have reservations in a conventional cemetery, they may have more options even there than they think they do. They can, they should find out, they should say, uh, you know, if, if they don't want to have their body embalmed or their loved one's body embalmed, they should tell the funeral home, we would elect not to have embalming. If they don't want to have a, a big metal casket, you know, titanium and all that, they can say, I'd like to to know about some of your more sustainable options. They don't want to lose your business. They So, I mean, it's just people don't know to ask the questions. So I just would encourage viewers to know that knowing what to ask, you can choose a more sustainable option, even at a conventional cemetery, if you know to ask the right questions. That's an awesome note, because I think people are probably afraid because, again, you just assume there's, I hate to say this phrase, but industry industry standards. So you don't Mm -hmm. really think that they could deviate. But that's wonderful to know that if you just ask and gather information and almost be an advocate for Mm -hmm. yourself, um, Mm -hmm. you can probably find a solution that fits. Yeah. Is there a website that um, our listeners could go to if they were interested in connecting with you to discuss green burials? If you go to narrowridge.org, that will take you to our website. There is a, um, a page for the Natural Burial Preserve, and then there are pages for our programs and our community land trusts and our rental facilities. We have eco-retreat facilities, um, but there's also, it can connect you to the email address and the phone to speak to me directly. Um, so I encourage anyone who's interested to get in touch. Well, great. Right, Mitzi, thank you so much. It was thank such you. a pleasure. Well, you're um, welcome, and best of luck to you both with your podcast, and let me know um, how to connect. Yeah, Absolutely. it was great. You're you're such an easy talker. It was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just be glad you don't have a, a camera on me. I turn, I just freeze. Oh, please. Oh, that's okay. Us <laughs> <Yes>. too. Us <laughs> too. I'm in sweat pants right now with no makeup yeah. on, so I love yeah. it. You all have a great evening. Thank you, you too. You too. Bye-bye. 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 Going into this episode... Nikki, you were dead set on being cremated. Do you think you're going to give it a second thought? Uh, yeah. Right? Well, I'm not, uh, yeah. I thought that he described it way more in a beautiful way than I thought was possible. 
Yeah. Well, and just so you know, I did a little Google research while we were chatting. And if you did want to be buried where Christmas trees are native, it looks like Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania are like the top spots. So maybe you could just, you know, stake out a piece of land somewhere over there. And then the kids could come and decorate the Christmas tree that's growing on top of you every year. No, literally, that's what I was thinking about. I was like, okay, well, I love Christmas. I think that would be fantastic to decorate each year for Christmas. Would be something Some special. Little cocoa, little Christmas carol. Oh, Merry Christmas! Yes, yes. I don't know. Well, I I thought that I thought it was like I really thought it was going to be more, you know, like hippie Carol Baskins, like walking through. <laughs> You know, <laughs> like that type of thing. Yep. The way that she describes it is way more intimate, and I appreciate that. Well, and I mean, you can probably speak to this better than I can because I'm in the fortunate position of haven't where I haven't had to deal with anyone close to me passing. But my perception would be that when you're dealing with like the funeral home and like that kind of like, I don't know, mass market, if you will, that it feels less impersonal, but did you feel like the same level of personal care that like you sensed through Mitzi in your experience with your mom? Um, no, everyone was very respectful. Everyone was very, just very, very nice, very, you know, made you feel not disrespected or they disrespected your loved one in any way. Um, Even up until like when the guys who were doing the cremation service were dressed all nice, I wasn't expecting it to be like that. And they were very respectful from start to finish. But I think as a family member who like to, to be a part of the process like what really got me was how she was describing the husband oh my god and same I was like like Will just needs to like I, guide my body into the ground as yeah, he mourns the loss you know <laughs> yes. I pictured like I pictured because I did things that I didn't think I was able to do with my mom and that sort of thing that like I pictured being able to, and my dad or whoever would want to go into the grave and do that for their person. Like that to me was. It feels like it brings like an element of closeness that maybe you can't get the traditional way. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think like picturing the way that she described it was more intimate and more loving than like, I think I would have had a harder time if it was a traditional way, like where I'm picturing you know, the casket and the lowering and the, you know, the whole traditional method of it. Yeah. And like there's something like moment. peaceful thinking like, oh, I'm going to lay this person down. I'm going to yeah. put my stuff here. Like, I don't yeah. know. I feel like the casket, like going down into the ground is like. That's a scary, scary. Thing that I picture in my yeah, head. 100%, yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Like that would be screwed or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and like everyone's just standing there. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I did. I feel like I totally felt like this is just like a more calm, calm way to go. I don't know. And I really did picture Edward Cullen coming out of the woods. That sparkling meadow. (laughs) Yes. I take it. I mean, I particularly am fond of the daffodil meadow from Big Fish. So that's kind of what I would like, you know. Yeah, I love Twilight, so. You know, I pictured that. I mean, that's very moody and like ominous. So it kind of fits the vibe, I guess, of a funeral. Yeah. I just, I just see pictures, the way that she described it and the way that what I had in my head and what it is that she does are two different things. I think this is just one of like those things that like it isn't um, the most common way of dealing with death and so it's not talked about like I don't know anybody that hasn't been either cremated or traditionally buried in a casket 
So I feel like this is just one of those things that it's like the more you have the conversation and the more it's like, Hey, have you ever heard about this? This is like totally random and cool. Like I had no idea the amount of fuel, like that blows my mind that like, think about just like on an average week, how much fuel those homes are going through, or even the fact that like, I thought cremation was like super quick. Like I thought you were like put in there and like done fast. I didn't realize that it was like hours. hours. And to Mm -hmm. me, that almost makes that now feel scary because I think I justified it to myself as like, that'll be the quickest way and it'll be over. But I didn't realize I was going to be like on a slow burn. I didn't realize that process until my grandpa really too because we did the same uh way with my grandpa like we and not everybody's like this but this is just me and this is just my family and that like I need to be a part of the process like start to finish I'm just going to be chilling waiting with you and then you're going to come on back home with me like I just feel like a closeness, like you got to be part of the process. And some people want to be away from the process. And maybe the green burial is not for those type of a people. But, you know, like I connected more than I literally ever thought I was. I really didn't think I was going to connect, to be honest with you. I think like it's doing a world of good for the planet. But it really does sound like there is a lot of therapeutic and healing that could potentially come out of such a involved process. Yeah, I connected so much with the therapeutic part of it. Yeah. It's like, And not that I'm not into the environmental part. You know, I recycle. But I mean, see, uh, I don't recycle. I'm sorry. Yeah. I wish I did. I don't. I know everybody's going to come at me, but I try. I don't. I do use glass water bottles though. So there's that, there's that, but I mean, we all take small steps in ways that we can. And so, yeah, I mean, if I can leave the world without producing more, you know, carbon dioxide and waste of fuel and all of these things, then yeah, it's a benefit, but ultimately selfishly, I want to go out the way that I feel less afraid of. Yeah. And the way that she described it. I'm totally at peace. It's like, I'm okay. A hundred percent. It's definitely the way that she described it and the way that she explained it is peaceful. I agree. Well, I don't know how you're going to top my guest next week, but I hope that you are bringing an A game person because I think Mitzi definitely exceeded and blew your mind. So the ball is in your court, sister. I hope you bring it. I didn't think I'd be on such an emotional roller coaster, but she took me on the Incredit Coaster there. There you go. Shout out Disneyland California Adventure, Credit Coaster. Best yeah. roller coaster ever. <laughs> She's a great person. And just like not even her job. I think that the way that she describes everything in life is just really nice. No, she's just like a beautiful soul. Like She's so compassionate and like warm. And I mean, I, I, like you said, her, her descriptions and the way that she speaks about the preserve, like I can picture it. I can see it. It's somewhere that I feel like I want to be. Right. Yeah. Like, it's just. Yeah. Uh, You did not tell Will I was crying. (laughs) I did tell Will you were crying. I texted him and he didn't respond, but I, I, I did tell him. I'm telling you, I was really... That's the, the money episode. This, it'll be titled, The Episode That Makes Nikki Cry. <laughs> or we can do like Friends. It's the one where Nikki cries. <laughs> but yeah, so um, until next week, my friend, I can't wait to see who you have for us. Okay. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. We do encourage you to follow us at Instagram at Body to Burial. Hit us up on Twitter at Body to Burial. And you guessed it, you can send us an email to hello at body to burial.com. If you have any guest suggestions, just let us know. Please hit the subscribe button or follow button on whatever app you are listening to. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.